Good evening, everybody. Um, I think my microphone is on. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Royal Society of Chemistry this evening. Uh, my name is Carl Mandel. I'm Professor of Extragalactic Astronomy and Head of Astrophysics at the University of Bath. But tonight, I am President of the Science Council. Not just for tonight, I should say. That is my role. Um, I'm hoping I'm not going to be removed after tonight. But So it's a real, a real pleasure to welcome you to the Royal Society of Chemistry and to thank our colleagues here for hosting us in this incredible building. Um, it's beautifully cool. It's wonderfully air conditioned. Um, there are masks available if you prefer them. Uh, don't feel free. Don't feel you have to. We're not accept, expecting a fire drill tonight. So if you do hear the fire alarm, you can either exit through the back and take the stairs that brought you up here. You can also exit the doors here and you will be guided. Um, the toilets are downstairs and along the corridor if you need them. And I believe we might also have a musical accompaniment by accident um, because we have rehearsals next door with our, our neighbours of the British Academy are having their, their glitzy uh, celebrity pre-summer exhibition party tonight. So I think you probably heard the, the band practising already, so we may have that in the background. But I think we're, we're all set for a very interesting evening. And what we'd really like to do tonight, it's great to welcome you all here, and I know you, you come from a quite a, a diverse range of organisations. And for me, this is really just the start of a wider conversation. So the Science Council is an, a membership organisation, so we, we have a convening role where we've brought together there we are, that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> as on cue, 36 learned and professional science bodies from across the academic, public and private sector science ecosystem, both nationally and internationally. Um, we work in the policy space and we also work to support our members. We hold the register for all of our members for registered science technician, registered scientist, chartered scientist and chartered science teacher. And so you can start to think about how that registration and qualification system cuts across the whole of our science science ecosystem. As president, two of my priorities are diverse pathways into science and trust in science. And tonight I think we will unpack both of those, but particularly the trust aspect. Trust is a small word, but it's a huge concept. I feel I should be singing or dancing as I'm saying these incredibly serious things. Um, but actually for me, it's about the whole integrity of our science ecosystem. And I think we've seen through the pandemic the importance of our scientists and also our science practitioners, because it's out into the professions, whether that's in biomedical sciences, whether that's in our hospitals, our testing labs, or our universities. I served on SAGE for 18 months of the pandemic, and I saw firsthand the high quality, the incredible dedication of our scientists and our operational experts, our health, public health, hospitals, and all of the experts that came together at different stages of the pandemic to help us to try to formulate advice for government at a time of radical uncertainty, under great political pressure, under the glare of the public, um, and also the media, and also very acutely aware of the loss of life. And so for me tonight is a celebration really of that work of our ecosystem, but also recognition that we seem to be in an even increasingly sensitive and volatile geopolitical world. As scientists, and myself included as an astrophysicist, I've always worked internationally. I've always taken it for granted that I will work with the best people to solve the biggest questions that we have about the universe. And I think in particular the war in Ukraine has brought special challenges, and again we'll, we'll speak about that tonight. Um, not just for Ukrainian scientists and the people who are suffering at the moment um, through that crisis, but also collaborations with Russia as a nation. Um, my work in government particularly looked at some of the security side and the importance of science diplomacy for working with countries with whom we have very difficult or no political uh, relationship. Russia was a priority country for me, and there are other countries that I, I can mention. But of course, what we're seeing now is that Russia has now been removed from major science collaborations because of their, their aggression towards Ukraine. How we then work with scientists who are under the, the Russian regime, um, who actually may have strong collaborations with the West, and who themselves may be at risk is also a very sensitive subject. Tonight, it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome our three eminent guests who will unpack some of these complex and, and tricky areas. Um, I'll welcome them to you each, and then each of them will speak um, to their themes, and then we'll be very happy to open up a discussion, to take some questions and answers, and then after, afterwards we have some refreshments to increase some networking. This is the first of our Science Council in-person events. It's great to see you all here after such a long two years, I think. We will be holding um, a climate conference in September, 
where we're hoping to bring together all of our learned and professional bodies to really look to see how we can take the whole of our science ecosystem to tackle the big global challenges that face us today. So without further ado, let me introduce my three wonderful panel, panel members. Um, on my left here, we have Sarah Main. Sarah is the Executive Director of the Campaign for Science and Engineering, which has been a leading voice on the importance of the UK's international science collaborations, particularly around Horizon Europe, which of course we see at the moment is embroiled in a wider political discussion. Sarah trained as a, bi a molecular biologist and has held prestigious fellowships at the University of Cambridge and has worked with Cancer Research UK, the Medical Research Council and in government with wide ranging experience both in public policy and as a researcher in her own right. On my right we have Vivian Stern. Vivian is currently Director of Universities UK International, part of UUK, which represents the collective voice of UK universities on the global stage and for her success and pain. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure out whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. We think it's a good thing. She's not decided yet. She's recently been appointed to the Chief Executive role of UUK itself as a whole, which I think is fantastic news and it's fantastic for our sector. So many congratulations for her, to her for that. We've caught her just before she takes up her post on the 1st of September, so she's fresh um, and ready to discuss with us before she takes on new challenges. Among her accolades, she was awarded the MBE for services to, in to international education in the most recent New Year's Honours list. And finally, last but certainly not least, Stephen Wandsworth has been Executive Director of the Campaign for At-Risk Academics since 2012, and he's served as a trustee of several NGOs working in the field of education and human rights. Before joining CARA, Stephen was a career member of the UK Diplomatic Service, where his last two posts were as Deputy Head of Mission in Moscow 2003 to 2005 and British Ambassador in Belgrade 2006 to 2010. Since March of this year, he's been the Chancellor of Cardiff Metropolitan University. So I'm sure you'll agree that across the panel, we have a vast range of experience, both in terms of the science ecosystem, science policy, and wider international science diplomacy. And so what I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists to speak for about 10 minutes on their, their points. Um, we'll start with Sarah, we'll move to Vivian and we'll end with Stephen. And then I'll open the floor to questions and discussions. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. It's really such a pleasure to be here. And I think in our room, we bring some glitz and glamour to the event, <laughs> I think. So, <laughs> um, I um, have the pleasure of being the Executive Director of Casey Campaign for Science and Engineering. Um, which is an advocacy organisation operating in the UK, um, really to try to put science and engineering at the heart of the UK's future and to ensure that the UK has an environment in which science and engineering can thrive. Um, we are supported by over 100 organisations which are, are members of CASE, in, including the Royal Society of Chemistry, and thank you to all of you here who do support us in, in a range of different ways. Um, and across those organisations from businesses to universities to um, learned and professional societies and research charities. Um, we see our businesses and charities invest over £30 billion a year globally in R&D. Um, facility for international collaboration and partnership is, vit is a vital part of the UK environment for science and a strength that the UK has been known for, as I'm sure we would all agree. This includes many dimensions, one of which is flow of talent into and out of the UK. Opportunities for people to come here, opportunities for people based in the UK to go elsewhere. Um, over the years, CASE has, I'm proud to say, CASE has led significant change on immigration rules that have brought an end to some damaging policies, such as the cap on tier two visas for international talent, and created positive changes in others, such as exemption of research activity from rules around indefinite leave to remain. This environment for international collaboration also includes access to shared facilities and expertise and the legal and regulatory frameworks to do so on a multilateral basis. And this, of course, we know is achieved at great scale by the European research programmes, Horizon 2020 most recently and now Horizon Europe. And, and others before that. So I just wanted to recap on some of the ways in which CASE has had a, a voice and, and some action in this area. And I'm sure in the Q&A, we're gonna dive more into you know, where, where this leads us next. Uh, going back to uh, the point at which the referendum was called, one of the things that CASE was able to do was gather and publish evidence on the views of UK researchers about the value of membership of the European Union to them. 
And that survey showed really overwhelming support, well over 90% of surveyed people responding positively, but for a range of reasons, both that access to skills, to facilities, to um, ease of collaboration. And CASE has been an advocate for association post the Brexit decision, uh, being a member of the Science Minister's <coughs> High Level Forum on Higher Education, Research, Innovation and the Relationship with Europe. Um, and I've, I have tried, and I think CASE has tried, to advocate in the interests of all parts of the science and engineering ecosystem, ranging from SMEs and their interest in the European relationship to universities and research institutes, and to the value of um, not just the Horizon Programme funds, but other funds, such as the structural funds, which have um, had provi provided huge support to regions of the UK. So, we, some of the things that we've done is, is, for example, to work hard with government departments in the UK to advocate for the need for the replacement for European structural funds to have due focus on R&D to be able to continue to support research and innovation in UK regions. We've made the case for getting over the line, completing the um, association deal in the media and have had opportunities to, to speak about that on, on radio and, and BBC uh, broadsheets and so on. And about a year or so ago, after the agreement uh, for the UK to, to be uh, part of European research programmes was first announced, we worked hard to highlight the issue of, of how it was going to be paid for, so where in government the money would come from to pay for the Horizon Europe um, programme. And we engaged with uh, members of parliament and, and different uh, political bodies and in the media, working with the Science Media Centre last year to try to bring greater public attention to the issue of, of actually how we were going to operationalise and pay for our association. Uh, and, and here we are now at this point where um, both sides, the UK and the EU, have negotiated every single line of the agreement on, uh, on research programmes and it simply remains to be signed and yet that is proving a substantial stumbling block. Um, I personally and CASE as an organisation do not want science to become a casualty of politics in these negotiations. Um, we see association as a win-win for Europe and the UK and a clear victory for research and innovation across the UK and, and Europe. If association is not agreed, it, it would not just mean a loss of access to a large funding programme. It could lead to damage, and I think already to some extent has led to damage, in scientific relations and collaborations that have been built up over many years by the hard work of research teams across the UK and Europe. And this is all coming at a time, a moment, when, as you know, the government at, at the very top, at, at prime ministerial level, is really working to strengthen the UK's international science brand, talking about you know, global Britain and science as part of that. If we reach a, a situation where association does not proceed, um, the government has talked about its plan B. I think it will be very important, and I'm sure we'll discuss this more, to really get into the detail of what that might be. And not only must it present a compelling long-term vision for the future of international collaboration, it must include short-term measures that will allow universities and businesses to adapt to such a sudden change in the research funding landscape. And I think, at the very least, I can say, that any plan B will take time to build and establish and the government must make provision for a transition which is bound at the very least to be bumpy. So that's all I wanted to say on that subject. I think this is a really rich um, topic and there are lots of other angles to it and I'm fascinated to hear from my colleagues and from you but uh, for now I'll set the scene at that point. Sarah, thank you. And I think the, the key points you, that really come out from what you've said about stability and that long-term vision, I think we all know that science takes time. And I've heard roughly a rule of thumb is it takes about five years to build a trusted relationship with a new research collaborator. And so if you don't know how bumpy the road's going to be or you think you've smoothed the bumps and suddenly there's a new chasm, then I can see that that increasing uncertainty um, poses real risk uh, to the trust 
that the UK is held in with, through other countries. So thank you for your remarks. I think they've they framed the, the discussion very well, the opportunities and the threats that I think we face in the short and the longer term. Vivian, over to you, please. Great. Thank you very much indeed. It's actually it's lovely to be back here for two reasons. I, my very first job was next door in the Royal Geological Society where I was a receptionist. And I just thought I'd died and gone to heaven because I got to work in this fantastic environment. And it's nice to be back next door. Um, also, um, I can see a couple of my uh, erstwhile colleagues, um, Alan, and I can see just a tiny weeny bit of Joe. Um, so greetings to you and, and Joanna, who is still a colleague. Don't go anywhere. Um, who I'm going to I'm going to pass uh, a ball to for the discussion because she's just completed a very interesting piece of work on the postgraduate research pipeline, which I'm going to try and weave seamlessly into this discussion and give you an opening to talk a little bit about. Um, so just building on what Sarah says, I'm going to sort of take a little step back. Um, we we exist, I think, as a fairly substantial team within Universities UK because on a number of uh, levels, I think it's fairly clearly understood by uh, the leadership of universities, but also by government and funding agencies that our international networks are really important to the UK's ability to punch above its weight, to do, uh, to do really outstanding work in research and in education. And, and you know, the, the fact that the UK is one of the most international collaborat collaborative systems in the world, perhaps the most in our, in our competitor group, um, maybe explains a bit why the UK has tended to outperform the level of investment as a proportion of GDP in research, which has consistently lagged behind the OECD average. Um, it's it's a, a bit lumpy. I mean, one of the things that I've observed over time is that there are certain di disciplines where international collaboration and research is just second nature. I mean, you wouldn't, I think you probably wouldn't dream of trying to pursue um, extra galactic astronomy um, in isolation from <laughs> colleagues all over the world. But in perhaps in some of the arts and humanities, there isn't the habit of co collaboration. In fact, my sister-in-law is a historian, I, and I, I asked her this question, and, and she, she, she responded to a way that made me think that the starting point is that somehow international collaboration in the humanities is cheating, which I found kind of, you know, that at some point I need to pick up that argument um, uh, with her. But, I, but there's an interesting question there about the degree to which the um, benefits of collaboration are being um, distributed as widely as they could be, as the other things that we're not doing that we could be doing. And maybe there's something about the way our funding structures are organized that, that have something to do with that. So it's a good thing. That's my first point. The second point I'd like to make is this is an, a very, very complicated moment. If I'm a pretty optimistic person, and I would say that, um, broadly speaking, if you are interested in uh, collaborating internationally in research, then the wind's at your back. First of all, there's the, no, the, the overall increase in uh, investment in the research system, which is non-trivial, in my view. And the second thing is that I think government has pretty clearly understood, partly as a consequence of us making a great big fuss about it during the Brexit debate, that collaboration internationally is, a, is an important part of the success story in the UK. So, so government is already thinking about how it can do more to smooth the path, to make it easier for you to collaborate uh, with counterparts in a wider range of geographies. And that's a good thing. But notwithstanding, you know, that sort of rather um, uh, sort of naively um, chipper um, uh, description of the state of play, there's so much being rewired. The, the thing that makes me most anxious is just how many elements of our research funding system are being, uh, are being you know, examined, reviewed, um, uh, redeveloped, reimagined all at the same time. And that frankly makes me nervous. So you've got the UK, the re review of um, uh, uh, UKRI, you've got the nurse review, you've got um, the development of a new model for international research collaboration, uh, irrespective of what happens with Horizon. So Newton is gone, GCRF is gone, there's something new coming down the track, which has got the working title, the blended fund, and that's still to be determined. And then there's this very, very, very big uh, question looming on the on that's a terrible way of putting it. Let me rephrase that. There's a very big question hanging over us about whether or not we're going to c continue to be part of the Horizon uh, program. Um, and even if you leave aside the the um, the individual issues at play within each of those, one thing that strikes me is my goodness, we've got a uh, in a system that really likes stability and predictability and 
and as you have said, Carol needs a certain amount of predictability in order to um, to flourish. We've got a whole bunch of balls on the pitch, and that makes me very nervous. Horizon. Um, I mean, look, we've as a as a as a research community, as a university community, industry players, you know, quite a wide spectrum of political um, actors argued till we are hoarse about the importance of Horizon. Um, we've um, in UK been working very hard in the last um, five or six months with European counterparts to try and make the argument very, very clearly um, right across the member states of the EU, in the UK, in Brussels, to the Commission, that Horizon Association shouldn't be used in a as a bargaining chip in a, in a wider political dispute. You might, really, I think when, whenever I've spoken about this to, uh, to, to colleagues in, in Brussels, I really might as well be talking to a wall. And that is not me criticising Brussels. I mean, do not get me started on the record of the UK government in its, uh, in its uh, conduct of the, uh, the uh, negotiations over withdrawal and its, and its um, uh, conduct since then. I, I just don't think it's wise for me to get dr drawn into that. Um, but the, the fact is what people will say in the Commission is it's a question of trust. Um, we can say science has nothing to do with Northern Ireland, and I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But the Commission will say we can't sign an agreement with you when you're busy reneging on the one you've just signed. And I don't see a way to bridge those two positions at the moment. I think um, the escalation of this in the last few days uh, is... I would say, broadly speaking, unhelpful. And my own view is we're heading out, that we're not going to associate. And I think that will be a colossal tragedy and it will be a failure of politics on all sides. And, um, and I think we'll be the poorer for it. Uh, and, and so will counterparts in other, um, in, not only in the European Union, actually, it's not other, other, other European uh, um, member states that will be damaged by this. There's huge international collaboration for which Horizon provides the platform. But there isn't very much to point, I think, in talking in um, speculative terms about whether we will or will not sign an agreement at this point. It's, it's, it's really genuinely, honestly out of our hands, no matter how hard we're working on the stick to science campaign. There's a certain amount of, I mean, you know, the stick to science campaign is partly about us reassuring ourselves that we, we will be able to look ourselves in the mirror at the end of all this and say we did absolutely everything we could think of to try to make this agreement uh, happen. Um, we've put everything we could imagine into that. And to be honest, if you haven't signed the campaign, if you haven't yet uh, signed the permit petition, do it. If you haven't written to your, uh, you know, your uh, counterparts in, in projects in, in, uh, in European member states, do it. You know, we ought to at least try um, everything until the very last minute. Meanwhile, we've got to take very seriously the alternatives because ultimately I think that's probably the destination we're heading towards. As Sarah says, there's you know, there is a great need for us to, um, to scrutinise, to debate, to, um, to inform the development of this programme. In this spending review period alone, it's uh, going to be the target of about £6 billion of investment. It's colossal. So it's £15 billion over the course of uh, the seven years of the Horizon programme. That's a lot of money. Um, the, the, as I see it at the moment, there is too little consultation going on. There is a certain amount of discussion going on behind closed doors. Um, we need to get that out in the public domain. We need to get that out into the research community so people who will use these instruments and who really know what will um, make it possible for them to collaborate internationally in as seamless way as possible um, and what they need on a domestic level have an opportunity to contribute views to the development of this new programme. And um, given the time that we've got, my guess is what's going to happen is you'll be given, we will be given um, a fait accompli on the kind of protect and stabilise front. So there will be two sort of buckets of stuff. One will be just to stabilise the system. And I don't think there's going to be any consultation about that. The other, which is the longer term alternatives, I think my guess is that we will start to see public, um, some sort of detail emerging into the public domain that will allow us to react in a, in a way that um, allows us to make it better. Um, but that part of what we need to argue is that if you're going to create something that is going to be 
a significant part of the research funding landscape in the UK in the long term, then uh, don't do it in a tearing hurry in a darkened room. It may take iteration. It may be that we develop something um, and then we iterate it over time as the research community has an opportunity to feed into it. Um, I, I, I will um, just, I'm going to, I'm going to raise a flag, which I'm, I'm going to hope uh, people will muster to on one issue, which is, um, and um, apologies for being slightly boring, but third country participation. So if we're out of horizon, um, we can still take part in collaborative projects, not everything, but a lot of things on a third country basis, if we can bring our own cash. The UK government has said so far under the kind of statements they've made about um, uh, the period of uncertainty that we're in, that they will, as part of the financial safety net, um, guarantee if you're in, a, in a, 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 a consortium and you win a grant at the European level, um, they will provide the funding to support your participation on a third country basis. There is a new front opening up, I think between Treasury and Bayes, with questions being asked about whether, in fact, such an uncapped guarantee is a good idea. You know, wouldn't it be better to pick the calls that we want to provide that guarantee for? My view is we should howl about that. And, and, and really, the fundamental reason is that I don't think it's going to be possible to get the message across about the third country participation guarantee unless it's pretty simple. I think if we don't have a fairly simple message for counterparts, if we have to explain, oh, well, that call we can't be part of, but this one we can, we will see a collapse in the inclusion of UK uh, research colleagues in European projects, and that would be a real shame. That's kind of taking uh, what is already a bit of a tragedy and making it a lot worse. Or to put it another way, that is losing the opportunity to save something from the fire. So that's a flag I expect to be sort of raising and asking people to muster to. Um, the other thing I will say is I think one of the big discussions will be about top-down versus bottom-up. I think we have a government at the moment that seems to want to direct research funding in very specific ways. I was on the board of the Fund for International Collaboration for reasons I don't really understand because, as Carol knows, I'm not, I don't even have, I don't even have a master's degree, let alone a PhD, so goodness knows why anybody thinks that my view on these things is of any value whatsoever. But on um, the thing that sort of depressed me about the Fund for International Collaboration, which in many ways was a good thing, is it ended up being like a kitchen drawer. You know, I don't know, I would, there we go, I'll give you a fiver if you can tell me what the Fund for International Collaboration um, funded across anybody there you go anybody who can stand here and tell me what was funded under that program i will pay you five pounds tonight the the, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's cheating i was in government except carol um, but but the the fact is it sort of supported very very specific things so if you want to work with colleagues in the republic of ireland on digital humanities your luck is in um, if you're interested in working on, I don't know, quantum technologies, uh, sorry, but you can do that with, I don't know, wherever it is you could do that with, somewhere else. Um, if you want to work on healthy soils with Israel, go for it, but not if you want to work on digital humanities. So, so that, that, I think that's problematic, this very sort of pointillist approach to funding for collaboration. I don't think that's, there's a role for that, but I don't think the balance should be skewed too uh, far towards that, that sort of very um, uh, centrally directed uh, approach. I think there should be much more room for bottom-up uh, researcher-driven um, collaborations. I have to stop talking because, you know, I'll get in trouble, but I hope that's somewhat... Vivian, lots and lots of points there to pick up. I mean, I think connecting back with something that you said, Sarah, about the work that CASE has done on multilateral regulatory frameworks and the ability for scientific collaboration. I think, you know, that then goes very much with what you're saying, Vivian, about the mechanics and the cogs of the machine that allow scientists to collaborate. So we can start with that wonderful philosophical top where it's great to collaborate internationally, but the scientist or the engineer on the ground in their day job thinking about how do I build this collaboration or actually there's this call or there's this piece and how do I navigate this? As you say, complexity really then starts to undermine that delivery on the big philosophy. And I think, you know, Sarah, you will have seen this at the coalface in terms of it's great to say we've got this initiative with country X, but actually when the scientists on the ground find that the visa system doesn't work or in fact their ability to be part of something like an international governmental organization and move their family starts to become a challenge. It starts to become really complex. So I think you're right. I mean, you're bringing together this sense of a perfect storm, huge opportunity, building on a huge excellence base, but actually it can all 
start to, to fall down, even with the best intentions politically. I think you're right, Vivian, in terms of the political storm that Horizon Europe is now sitting in. And certainly my experience across Europe has been that it's been unequivocal support from the scientists and the policy teams and also the policy makers um, and the politicians that UK science should be part of Horizon Europe. And that may also explain why it's now such a hot political football, because everybody <laughs> agrees on both sides. So it is unfortunate if that goes by the wayside. And again, your point about timescales, so, and Sarah, you made this point as well, this short term, we have to keep the system going until we figure out what's going to happen. That's true on a daily basis, but also that long-term vision, that long-term stability and what kind of instruments will we have and how do we consult to make sure we have something that's fit for purpose. I personally have sat on European research funding um, grant panels and I've seen you know, researchers from around the world sit on those panels. They review proposals from scientists around the world and it's a huge bureaucratic instrument. I don't mean bureaucracy in a bad way, but I mean in terms of the official support. So we shouldn't also underestimate the mechanisms that have to be put in place and the cost of those mechanisms in order to do the peer review. And finally, I think the top down versus the bottom up. This, I think, is always a tension in government. Ministers come in, whatever the initiative, whether that's science, whether that's education, and they think, right, I, I can deliver on my policies. Why can I not pull that lever? Why can I not spend that money? And I think UKRI has that balance between their top-down programs and their peer-reviewed bottom-up science, the Haldane principle where it's peer review um, on excellence rather than just the strategic. The UK, in my experience, I think, with the Global Challenges Fund, you know, has been really successful in mobilizing the community, but that's because the bottom-up funding was well done. If you lose that and you lose your fellowships and you, nobody's quite sure how to navigate the system, then when you do a top-down call, you don't have a community to mobilize. So I think that's where some of the real risk factors lie. And you really, indeed, we're kind of like trying to fly a plane as we build it and figure out the aeronautics of it. So Vivian, thank you. Stephen, um, you know, you have a tall order now, so we've put all of the opportunities and all the challenges out, and we'd like to pass on to you for global instability, science diplomacy, and the state of the, the world, which is no small order, um, or whatever points you'd like to make. But yeah, I think particularly In from... eight minutes, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, bringing it back to the personal, you're right, that actually it's scientists who do do science, and actually I think the, the point you made, Sarah, about infrastructures, you know, if your country is at war, you are a refugee or you're fleeing from conflict, then how do you do science, how do you access, how do you think about the science you want to do when you're thinking about survival? And I know you, your society has a, a huge role to play in helping connect. We still have um, a stable country here, whatever, we have the luxury of discussing uh, our science systems, we don't have bombs falling out of the sky. So Stephen, over to you, thank you. Right, thank you. And uh, like Vivian, I'm glad to be in this building for a rather different reason, a rather more historical reason. Uh, our foundations go back to 1933, when William Beveridge, who was then the director of the London School of Economics, was in Vienna and heard what was starting to happen in Germany just next door, where the Nazis had come to power, and one of the first edicts was to ban non-Aryans from the public service. And in their system, that included university lecturers, which meant that a lot of people whom he knew personally were about to be kicked out of their jobs. He was scandalised, naturally, came back to, the, to London, got together with about 30 other vice-chancellors, Oxbridge College heads, presidents of the Royal Society of British Academy, and launched what they called the Academic Assistance Council. And the founding statement was issued from the rooms of the Royal Society. And if you look at the logos on the radiators here, they are RS, which is the Royal Society. That is where the Royal Society was at the time. So we are in the building from which what is now CARA was, uh, was launched. The, the founding statement... Um, was deliberately couched not in terms only of Germany. It was about the wider problem, which they foresaw, uh, and they defined the mission as the relief of suffering and the defense of learning and science. And that is pr still pretty much what we would say we're, we're doing today uh, in a rather different context. Defense of learning and science is perhaps now what we call academic freedom, but it's all the same, same idea, but certainly relief of suffering. Click forward almost 90 years, and I think they would have been pretty horrified to think that 90 years on there was still a need for this. And we are still very much in that original rescue mission business, although now obviously in a much wider context with people from all around the world. Um, we have two programs. The, the fellowship program is essentially the, the rescue mission. And for that, we rely very heavily on a network of 130 UK universities and research institutes who have signed up to work with us, and in, in large measure on the basis that they will consider hosting an academic at risk. And increasingly, as the need has grown, we have pushed more and more of the cost onto them. 
Uh, when I first joined CARA, actually the, the acronym CARA stood for Council for Assisting Refugee Academics. And at that time, the focus was on those who were here already and needed maybe small amounts of help uh, to get back into academia. With the situation, particularly in Syria, uh, where people were still were contacting us from Syria in grave danger and needing help to get away, we sort of changed the focus. And so dropped the refugee, and so in our council for at-risk academics, we were keen to keep the acronym. Um, after three name changes in our lives, it's, it, it's important not to lose that. And so we had to go back to universities, who were, originally we were just saying, can you host this person and perhaps, perhaps waive some fees or give a bit of help with this or that? We had to go back and say, well, actually, can you host this person and waive any fees and provide funding for accommodation and living costs and maybe visa fees and maybe a national health surcharge and so on. And so it became a much bigger ask of the universities. And to be fair to them, after perhaps an initial shock, um, most of them did go back and say yes. And actually, it was quite helpful because before, when we weren't asking for very much, it was something which maybe a head of department could do at a university that nobody else would really need to know about. It was something which he or she chose to do, and that was fine. Uh, once you're saying to somebody, can you please host this person for maybe three or four years if they're doing a PhD, uh, and by the way, there's a partner and there are two kids, and can you pay for the whole thing? Uh, you're talking large sums of money, which has to go quite high up the university system, and generally to the executive board or whatever it's called. Uh, but it does mean that when they, they agree to that, it becomes part of what that university does. And they have been extremely generous to us over the recent years. Um, as I say, Syria was the, the spur, if you like, for that. But then in 2016, we had the situation in Turkey, where people signed a petition, were being kicked out of their jobs, and then after the failed coup attempt, a whole wave of dismissals from the public service in general, including many thousands of academics, some universities being closed completely. And then, of course, much more recently. Now, at, at the time, in 2016, uh, we were getting maybe at the peak of, of Syria on top of Turkey, about 20 applications a week. Um, in autumn last year, after Kabul fell to the Taliban, we had 750 in three months, including 93 in one week alone. So a different order of magnitude. And we were just sort of getting to terms with that. And then along comes Ukraine. Uh, different problem altogether. Uh, in Afghanistan, although we have all these applications, most of those applying are still in the country and in many, in many cases are too frightened to move around much because they, they know that they're targets. They have a minister of higher education who condemns academics for allowing blasphemy to come back into Afghanistan and warns them that if they step out of line, they will not see the sun rise the next day. And of course, women are under grave pressure because girls can no longer go to secondary school. Um, higher educations are totally segregated. But whether it has, has any future at all for women, who knows? So a lot want to get away, but they're scared about moving. They can't apply for UK visas in Afghanistan. And everybody we're helping comes to the UK on a regular visa. They're not coming as refugees. The, the host university is the visa sponsor. So they first have to get to Pakistan or Iran where they can apply for a visa. And that's not easy either. So it's quite complicated. With Ukraine, uh, very different situation with the Homes for Ukraine scheme, the Ukraine Family scheme. People just pop up. Uh, they arrive here by themselves and then say, well, here I am, can you help us? So we're responding to that. We have over 100 uh, applications from Ukrainians currently. And of course, quite a few Russians as well. Because there are a lot of Russian academics who don't want nothing to do with this. In the early days, there was a petition online of scientists and science journalists, which attracted over 8,000 signatures. And it was, it was taken down by the Russian state. You can still, still find copies that have been uh, put up elsewhere. Uh, they're all there with their names. You know, senior uh, um, members of the Academy of Sciences in Russia. Um, I imagine they've had sort of some quite serious talking to from the authorities since then. But uh, you know, they, they also need to get out. And from our point of view, we are still in the business of helping those who are you know, needing to get away. We don't, we don't do politics. So the fact they come from Russia doesn't matter. If, if they are at risk, then they get help. Uh, and our university partners have been good, very good with that. We had a certain, a certain level of, sort of continuing help, if you like, up until middle of last summer, which was good. But then with Afghanistan, we got a lot more offers of funding and places at partner universities. And then after the Ukraine crisis began, the same thing again. So we actually have now quite a lot of support, quite a lot of places uh, open to us, which we are taking up as and when we can. And we also had to go back to universities and say, well, of course, it's great that you're offering all these places for Afghans and Ukrainians, but actually we do still have Syrians and people from Turkey and Yemenis and, 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 um, not, not least Myanmar, which gets rather forgotten about, but it's pretty horrible. So a lot of people needing help to get away. And after the first conversation, many universities came back and said, okay, well, we've offered sort of four new places, but can we keep one for an Afghan? You can have the other three for anything. So we sort of 
reached an agreement on that. So we have a lot of offers from universities, a lot of funding from different sources coming through. Um, the main problem is actually just getting people moving um, from, uh, not from Ukraine, but from other countries and get them over here. Uh, it is a long process. They, they do need to get UK visas. Uh, that's not actually a problem. We have learnt over the years that although the university is the visa sponsor, we work very closely with that university to make sure everything is uh, done properly, every T is crossed, every I is dotted, because if one is not, uh, the application will be thrown out. And also to work with the applicants so they understand what the process is and how it works, and so they aren't taken by surprise. And on that basis, we've had a 100% visa success rate for the last four years, and are hoping to keep it that way. Uh, Although our main asset, as I say, is our university network here, uh, we are international. Uh, we work closely with uh, our two US partners, Scholars at Risk and the Scholar Rescue Fund. We have some jointly, jointly funded uh, fellowships here. Uh, they've helped us with placing people in Canada. We also work with the Philip Schwarz Initiative in Germany, set up in 2016, which provides funding for universities who want to host a threatened academic. The university uh, applies. Uh, and there's a, there's a selection panel process, and we're involved with that and with assessing the, the threat of the candidates for that program. Uh, we've been less involved, but we are, we are associated with the, the French pause scheme, uh, which began a year later, 2017. And of course, here in the UK, we're, we're just now uh, involved with the British Academy, uh, leading the Researchers at Risk program, which has UK government funding. And we've been asking for years, you know, can, can't the UK government do something like the Philip Schwartz Initiative, which began as a foundation-funded uh, activity, but is now German government-funded through the foreign ministry. And we seem now to be getting there. So far, this scheme is just for one year, but I think it's got a good chance of becoming more permanent. So we, we may see that. Um, on Horizon Europe, we're also involved with that because um, there was a European program for assisting uh, uh, exiled or threatened academics called Inspire Europe. Uh, phase one, unfortunately, the launch was pretty close after Brexit. And there were a lot of complications, so we, we couldn't, in the end, take part in phase one. Uh, phase two kicks off this autumn. Uh, it's one of the projects which, of which there is a, a guarantee, and we have a signed letter from UKRI saying that if we aren't, if the UK doesn't associate with Horizon Europe, um, UKRI will foot the bill, which in this case is 199,000 euros. They didn't actually ask us what it was going to cost, so anyway, <laughs> that's gave me the letter anyway. Um, so we've got that. So we will, we will be in that program, which is great, because uh, a number of other European partners are, are in that. And it is very important that this is seen as a part of an international problem. It's not just for the UK. Uh, we haven't got a direct counterpart uh, in Europe. Uh, we have to say the two American counterparts, but um, there's no direct equivalent to ourselves. So it's really good that we are seeing more activity there and uh, more people getting involved in working out what they can do and what their universities can do. Their universities with a very different funding system in most cases can't directly support people themselves because they can't divert the funds to support particularly accommodation and living costs. Um, but that, that's where these schemes come in. And they are getting more creative in finding other ways of uh, get, getting money out. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Uh, very considerable need. We're grateful for support from universities, but also learning societies. Royal Society of Chemistry is very helpful, and Microbiology Society also. Because often what people need when they come out and come over here as exiles uh, is desperately to keep in touch with colleagues and network and to learn from experience. So when they do eventually go back, as we obviously hope they will, uh, they can take that back with them, and including the networks, so they're much better able then to develop in a sort of global context with international scientists, whereas perhaps in their own countries, in many cases, they were a little bit insulated, uh, and Syrian academics didn't really have a lot of contact with the outside world. Uh, so there's you know, a lot to be done, and ideally, when the, the right moment comes and they can go back, uh, there'll be big benefits from it all. But meantime, it's a question of keeping them safe, uh, and with their families, many of them do come with families, and uh, helping them to develop, and also learning from them. They bring with them their experience, their particular expertise and skills, um, particularly in things like agriculture, where they, some of the problems of uh, agriculture in drought-stricken countries, we're learning to cope with, <laughs> we're facing that here in the UK in some cases, so we can learn from that. So yeah, it's, it's a two-way process, um, but a lot going on, and very happy to take any questions about it later on. Wonderful, thank you, Stephen. And I think it's, it's fantastic to see not just the work that you've been doing over these years, but those networks 
of support in other countries and the fact that you have the examples and the expertise to support other countries to do this, but also to network with them. And as you say, it is international. And it's interesting what you, what you say about the individual and helping those scientists to create those networks and connect in with the science ecosystem is really important. And I know I've, I've spoken to colleagues who've been in that situation and they've said that for all of the challenges and all the worries they have with family and with the conflicts back in their, their home country, actually to be able to go and do some science, they're physically safe with their families and they can switch off for a few hours and actually do some science is actually is, is a huge boost for them. So that, that, that alone is wonderful. And I think you're right in terms of that shared best practice. That's what I think is really important about the international science collaboration, that it doesn't see a border, that we do have shared global challenges. We are looking at global famine. We are looking at climate change and global health issues beyond quantum tech and emerging technologies. Um, and I think what, what you said about that, that idea of that circulation of talent giving people safety, giving people a little bit of security uh, so that they can go back and rebuild that in their countries. That, again, hopefully is future stability in the world um, when potentially we get past these, these political conflicts. Um, I'd also love to sort of open the floor now for questions. And I think, um, Sarah, you mentioned about facilities and the importance of access to facilities. And I think that intersects really strongly with what Stephen's point is, that, you know, through science diplomacy, we've seen that it's been important to build these capacities in countries. But of course, if an authoritarian regime suddenly decides that international collaboration is suddenly not allowed, or a conflict breaks out and suddenly you can't have access to those facilities when they're built cross-border, that also then undermines in some ways the root of the science that we're doing here. And I think we're seeing that a little bit with pulling out of some of say, the big space missions with Russia. There are alternatives, but of course we were building up that trust and now suddenly that, 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 that stops. So I'd be really interested to hear some of your reflections there and actually what we can do, I guess solution-wise, maybe a little bit of insurance in the future. How do we open up facilities? How do we build these collaborations? Knowing that conflict will happen, knowing that there may be some uncertainty in the future and being very provocative, Will the UK, given our current political situation around things like Horizon Europe, will we still be seen as the trusted partner um, or will that also be eroded? And we can't necessarily take every, anything for granted that we've said on this panel. So uh, they, they were rhetorical questions. I'm happy for people to ask them in the, on, on the floor. But colleagues, uh, questions are open now. Yes, please. Go ahead. Andrew McKenzie from the Physiological Society. I'm picking up on Horizon Europe and I agree, I think, if the pessimism about uh, where we are is probably uh, correct if you've got a government and an EU that's willing to put the Good Friday Agreement at risk. I, I think science uh, and Horizon Europe probably would fall into, into the same category. As a community, at what point do we reach a tipping point where we perhaps, by talking up the importance of Horizon Europe to UK R&D collaboration, we make a rod for our own back if we end up not associating and we're talking down the ability of the UK to, to stand on its own two feet in whatever plan B program uh, might emerge um, if, we, if we're not successful in getting what we all want. Um, at what point do we as a community need to maybe pivot towards talking up the advantages of being outside of Horizon Europe, even if you know, all of us in this room would agree that it would certainly be a second uh, choice option? Thank you. That's a really quest good question. Maybe I just start with a couple of remarks and then I'll open it to the panel. When I was working in government, we were very, very sensitive to this because it was not helpful when working with ministers to portray Horizon Europe as a Remain position. There is a sense that the academic community, broadly, maybe not uniquely, was Remain supporting. Um, you know, rhetoric around left-leaning academics in universities. So we were very careful as chief scientific advisors to really provide the evidence um, that the evidence of UK researchers from whatever nation they've come from, that actually world-leading scientists were applying to that portal, winning it through open peer review against world-leading scientists and choosing to come to the UK. That's really that, that circulation of money. Much more subtle than the UK government paying for our, our membership and us getting the money back to do our science. So it's about that bringing people around the world through some kind of financial filter to come to do science in our country. Sarah mentioned facilities, having world leading labs and facilities, having access and core membership of those facilities, but having the ecosystem within our research environment to be an attractive place to come to do science. And again, you know, academic freedom, we are not under an authoritarian regime. You come here to do the best research 
whether that's science, whether that's humanities, whether that's the arts. So I think that was the framing we were giving to ministers. It was a very difficult conversation because they wanted to see the value for money. They wanted to understand why would we pay into Brussels for you all to have it back in the UK? Why don't we just give it directly to you? So that was actually quite a subtle message. It wasn't that we have to be associated with Horizon Europe at all costs. It was that it was very much a value added through those partnerships and that it actually helped us to use that to leverage bigger international collaborations. I work very much with colleagues in the US and there's very, very few instruments to do that formally. It's because the US has had a very open collaborative approach, particularly an open skies approach, and we saw that close down under President Trump's presidency. So there was very much a sense of national science for US science, and that was quite a shock to my communities where we, we, we've collaborated throughout, throughout my career openly, and we bring shared things to the table. So, you know, I've heard the Prime Minister talk very passionately about the UK as a science and technology superpower by 2030, and I think he does believe that. And in order to have that so-called strategic advantage in global Britain, I believe we have to do that through collaboration. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a conversation about valuing the science ecosystem and what do we need to be fit for purpose for the coming years and decades. But Sarah, let me, let me ask you to, to unpack that question from your perspective. Uh, thanks, Kat. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to listen to what you have to say, having that perspective as Chief Scientific Advisor in the Foreign Office. Um, I mean, Andrew's a very experienced advocate, and um, I know I'm not saying anything he doesn't know already when I talk about... I was just trying to sort of visualise in my head what, what I thought would be useful, and I think, you know, all of us that work in this space do a range of things, and and some of them are much more behind closed doors and some of them are much more um, sector facing or public facing. And I was, I was just sort of thinking of Andrew's question. Can I just move your microphone? Awesome, please. That would be wonderful. Thank you. I was thinking of um, this image of the tipping point and, you know, maybe, you know, in fact, actually, discussions around alternatives have been ongoing for quite some time. You know, in a, you know of course, you know, the. Reed Smith review was commissioned. I think, you know, part of it was you know, all sorts of reasons for that being commissioned, but part of it was to start to surface the conversation with the sector. And, and so I think, you know, from what I'm hearing, there, there, there's quite a lot of conversations already ongoing, one-to-one um, -one between, you know, companies, you know, different stakeholders in the sector and, and government on on their interests in, in informing and, you know, beginning to discuss what Plan B might look like. But that process has, has been happening for some months, I would say. Um, and I, I mean, you know, Vivian, you know, very close to this, you know, you know, exactly thinking about the timing of when you do a very publicly facing piece of advocacy, which, you know, you UK have just done, um, uh, and how you balance that with the internal conversations. Um, I, I think there, there is a, you know, additional um, factor here, which is being discussed around um, the money that has been put by Treasury to um, pay for our Association to Horizon Europe, and the question of whether that is retainable. Okay? So whether the options, you know, I, I, what I'm hearing is the conversation moving from you know, is it A or B, is it association or plan B, to, you know, is it any range of other things? And, you know, is it, is it you know, a, a sort of ongoing stasis or limbo or, you know, or kind of period of uncertainty or plan B? Is it, is it money now or money later? Is it money now or lose that money? You know, and uh, so I think... Um, it, I, I, I've heard Vivian talk about actually, you know, to the binariness of, of association or plan B is actually fairly unhelpful. Actually, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to sort of talk about a range of possibilities here. Um, but I think it's, it's that that's moving that dial towards ever more growing internal conversations that will tip into more public, um, public and sector facing conversations. I mean, you know, we're having a sector facing conversation about this right now, you know, and I think. Um, you know, th those are just increasing. To my mind, uh, and, and Vivian has said this as well already, that, that you know, there is, an, in, 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 when you think about the, 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 the body of information about what 
Horizon Europe is and the body of information about what Plan B is, there is a very large difference in that. So I think, you know, one issue is definitely that we're talking about something conceptually that we don't have a very good handle on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other key there that when you put the money into Horizon Europe, you've committed that for seven years. So it goes back to that stability question that that money is ring fenced. We have spending reviews every three years in the UK, sometimes every year, depending on the, the, the governmental situation. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that thought with you, Andrew, and you can use that as you see fit. Vivian, did you want to come in on this point? I mean, I think it's a great, it's a great question. And I guess it's one that we're sort of asking ourselves all the time, because look, the bottom line is if you've got six billion this spending review to spend on, um, you know, new instruments in, in research, can you do exciting things with that? Yes, you can. Absolutely. No question about it. Um, and the other, I think the other side of it is that, um, you know, in a sense, there comes a point when you recognise that it's, th there's no point any longer in explaining why Horizon would be wonderful if it's disappeared. And I feel like it's going to be a replay of Erasmus. You know, I remember people, you know, spending a lot of time and energy um, talking about how, how terrible it was we'd left Erasmus after we'd left. And I probably didn't often do this, but in my head, I was saying the time to tell people how you felt about Erasmus was a year ago and you didn't do it. Now this is done, right? There's no point in us bewailing what's happened. We have to make the best of where we are. And I think that's the kind of responsibility that's on our shoulders now. It's not about, there probably will be a moment on the morning that this crystallizes where I will be unable to resist the temptation to say this is a colossal political failure. You've let us all down. But having said that, the next breath has to be, right, let's make this brilliant. What could it be? What could we do with this opportunity to take six billion pounds and put it into things that will make us better able to produce outstanding research? And, and I would say as an organization, we're in that, that constructive space firmly now. We have been for a long time. You know, we've got a task and finish group that's working very closely with Bayes and UKRI to try to inform the development of alternatives. We, um, we, 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 we are enthusiastic about the things that could be done. I think we're also pushing government to be a little bit more visionary because um, the, there is something exciting. I, I don't know whether it's, it'll get me into trouble saying this, but, you know, when you look at why do we get excited about Horizon Europe, there are basically two things I think that people focus in amongst all the different instruments. One is the, the prestige attached to ERC and the nature of ERC grants. That's one thing. And the other thing is this sort of platform for very, very broad um, collaboration through, I can never remember whether it's pillar two or pillar one. Now <laughs> I get very confused about the pillars have swapped, but the collaborative um, uh, um, uh, projects. And if you think, well, what is that? That's a big old common pot. That's a bunch of people saying, we are a bunch of countries putting money into a common pot and then allowing their researchers to kind of seamlessly work together on grants that they, they bid for um, together. And so what I think is missing for the conversation is the 20 or 30 year vision that says what we should be doing is trying to build a common pot at an international level with the absolutely best science systems in the world. Um, perhaps it would have to be thematic because something as open and broad-based as Horizon might be very difficult outside of um, a political structure. And I know that there were people who will say, oh, well, you know, that's very difficult and you'll never get the political will or the funding cycles to align. But I think a little bit of naive, naive ambition would be no bad thing on a very, very long time scale to say, okay, we really liked this thing. It felt a bit like being in there. I don't know anything about football, so please, asterisk, this is nonsense. But it felt a bit like, you know, this was the Premier League. But if we're booting it, booted out of it, well, we better create a Champions League. We better do something. I know that sounds a bit like that breakaway league. I'm going to retract all my comments about <laughs> football. But the point is, if it's a great idea, maybe the vision should be building on that great idea. I, I, I think... The thing is, I think we've been calling for some vision from the government on, you know, around their R&D, you know, ambitions for quite a lot of time. And I do think we've had these conversations years ago that this didn't have to be one or the other. There is no reason why the UK can't have an ambitious and visionary international strategy and be part of the European um, programmes. I, you know, I accept, you know, Vivian's um, analysis of, you know, where we are. And, you know, you've just said actually, you know, the, it's gone, the moment's passed, you know, we, the sort 
sort of tipping around it, but I, I do think this is, you know, being constructed and painted as an either or, which it doesn't have to be. It, and um, and I, th I think that's a really interesting point, and I think unpacking the bilateral, so, I mean, I've just noticed many countries being flagged as associating with Horizon Europe, whether that has substance, but when you start to hear countries as far away as New Zealand associating with Horizon Europe, what does that mean that the UK doesn't? Similarly, I think if you are looking at bilaterals, you know, does one country say, well, actually, we'll collaborate with Germany because they're in Horizon Europe, whereas we'd love to collaborate with the UK, but that looks a little bit more confusing. I think your point, Vivian, though, about that 30-year vision, for me, what I would love to put on the table there is the percentage of GDP that goes into R&D in the country. So we do a huge amount with our public funding. We have something like 0.7% GDP from the government into publicly funded research and development, and total across the ecosystem, about 1.7%, which is very low compared to many countries that we're talking about being in that premium league beyond Horizon Europe. Um, we have an ambition to get to 2.4% GDP and Sir Patrick Vallance has been very clear about aiming for 3%. And in some ways, are we double counting or are we really looking for new investments? So for me, that's the, that's the big ambitious piece. When we start to ask government, how do you articulate you know, doing all of this on 0.7 or 1.7, when actually Germany's at something like 3.4% and Israel's at 4.1%. So they can actually use Horizon Europe incredibly well. We've been incredibly good, I think, at value for money. So you're right, we have punched above our weight and we've squeezed every pound for pound. And the question then is now that we have that competitive system, we have all these wonderful learned societies and professional societies supporting that ecosystem, the talent pipeline, the international reputation, imagine now if you increase the investment. That's, the, that's the, the, the fuel on the fire, I think, which is the message that I would love you know, for leaders like you to take to government so that we're not talking about, is it Horizon Europe or not? We're actually talking about our big vision for the UK you know, as an R&D, not just a science and technology superpower by 2030. What do we need to do to get there? For me, it's that investment. So, Andrew, that was a very long answer to um, a, a wonderful question that triggered all of this big discussion. So I think we're just going to go for like 10% GDP. How does that sound as an answer to your question? Any other questions, colleagues from the audience? We've, we've dominated it on the panel, but hopefully in an interesting way, and maybe even one to, 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 for, for Stephen on the, the wider international multilateral. Helen, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question about, we've spoken about funding, and we've spoken about the impact of war, so movement of um, um, researchers and academics. What is the thing that we've not yet thought about that we need to be thinking about? Because it might always be too late by the time it kind of happens. So as a kind of science community, what is the thing that you think we should be focusing some thinking time on so that we can come up with those future visions and solutions? Thank you, Helen. I'm going to pass to Sarah, uh, first of all, and then I'm going to pass to Stephen and Vivian. And I'll preface my personal preference there um, is standards and trust and integrity. I think that is the big global challenge that we have. We're seeing a huge amount of disinformation, anti-science. We see countries where people were unconfident at coming forward for the vaccine. We didn't have that problem in the UK because our scientists are highly trusted. But that's not something that we can take for granted. I think from the Science Council perspective, we have the, you know, the registers of qualifications. We don't see that picked up in the academic sector at all. Um, but internationally, I think there's a huge appetite to understand what a really highly qualified, good practitioner in science looks like, whether that's a science technician, whether that's a professor, whether that's somebody in an industry or a biomedical lab in a hospital. And for me, that's the bit that my science advice was feeding into other countries. How do we have a science advice mechanism that draws from a science system of integrity? And I think you can only do that internationally. But Sarah, let me start with you. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Yeah, really good point, and I agree with it. And just to mention, I, I'm hoping that we'll begin to understand a little bit more on public opinion through some um, opinion polling and survey work we're doing in case under the banner of the Discovery Decade. So hopefully we can bring a little bit of data into that conversation. Um, there's something that I wanted to flag that I think is a issue that we need to think about before it's too late and it's not an issue an area of my expertise but it keeps bugging me and the two people I think that might be able to really help with this are both Carol and Vivian so I kind of think in combination they might say something about this but I think for me the the issue is that um it is one of you know where is the platform the forum a safe forum for discussion between academia 
and uh, the government's uh, foreign affairs and um, you know, global positioning about science diplomacy, basically, in academia. So where, what I think we are seeing is, is through the integrated view and then the government's position on you know, post-Brexit, government's positioning on, on where it wants to be in the world, and, uh, you know, and lots of geopolitics going on, that the government has an agenda on the UK's um, collaborative relationships, um, not just in a scientific or R&D sense. But I also see that you know, the impact agenda has been driving universities to encourage academics to collaborate widely and to attract third stream income, and that is what's happening. But I feel that those two things could be diverging or losing connection to each other. And that's what I see as the thing that's coming that we need to talk about before it's too late, because I can imagine we'll, you know, at some point there might be a very difficult moment where either one of those two parties said, you know, says this is broken and you know, either something has to stop or you know, something collapses in, in, a, in a very damaging way. Now, it's, it's not an area of my expertise, but I keep thinking, you know, is there a forum? Does the Foreign Office have a forum for discussion about this? And it, it's very sensitive because really it runs into academic freedom and so on and so on. Um, you know, to what extent academic uh, collaboration is driven top down in a strategic way or bottom up by academics. But, you know, is there a place for that discussion? Um, I, I think it would be really valuable to surface that and discuss it more widely. Yeah, that's a really good point, Sarah. I would just say that within the Foreign Office, we have the Science and Innovation Network, which is a network of 100 science and innovation attaches around the world. I oversaw their work when I was CSA. And their role really is to help us to understand the local science and innovation ecosystem within the country. Now, that helps us to build good partnerships, but it also helps us to navigate difficult relationships. But I think you touch on a, on a wider point that government has recognised. We've worked with our um, security partners. We've worked with very closely with Bayes and set up the Trusted Research Initiative, which is being rolled out to universities. It's incredibly difficult to operationalise. Um, but it's very much about maintaining academic freedom, maintaining universities or, as autonomous organisations, not government-managed organisations, which I think is critically important, but helping university leaders to understand how to do due diligence on all of their partnerships. And I think we're going into a time where that will be immensely difficult because of some of the financial challenges that universities are facing. So to be able to say, I choose not to take this partnership because of the risk it brings, because I've been able to assess that accurately. And you're right that sometimes that may be a risk that government might prefer you to take because there is a science diplomacy win on it. <laughs> but it might be very difficult organisationally. So I'm couching my language sensitively here, but I agree completely that making that safe space to have that conversation, because it's very dynamic, and I think that's the key, that it actually changes with time. And it's about the principles that you use, rather than this is the right country or this is the wrong country for this subject, that it does actually change with time. So thank you for raising that. I think it's quite... I, I think there important. is something actually even a step further back from that, which is not how do you operationalise you know, decisions about this is okay, this is not, but should you, can you, is, yeah. is this whole thing allowable at all, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think that's, for me, what's missing. Yeah. Thank you. Vivian. Oh, actually, Stephen, maybe I'll bring you in here, um, if you may, and then, then Vivian after. This. Sure. No, I think it's really important just to realise how much skill and talent there is out there now in, in the world, which is in real danger. Uh, people who are not able to go on working, um, in some cases, not even able to go on living. As, as bad as that, uh, and who, who need help. But it's not just help because you know, we want to help them as people, of course we do, um, but we value what they have in their heads. If you go back to the 1930s when, when we began, the, the impact of people who came over in those five or six years between 33 and 39 on British cultural and scientific life was huge. Uh, now, we'd like to say we have sort of 16 Nobel Prize winners amongst our fellows in that time, True, but um, many of them didn't actually get their prizes till the 50s or even the 60s. So it took a little while, you know, it took 20, 30 years. They, they often came over quite young. Um, and you know, the people we're helping now are, in many cases, also quite young. Um, who's to say whether they're Nobel Prize winners there, maybe one day, perhaps. But they're certainly talented, they have a lot of knowledge. Uh, and there are also colleagues still in those countries who need help to keep going. As I mentioned, we have sort of two programs. The other one is our, our, our regional programs. We did one a few years ago for, for Iraq from 2006, 2012, 
helping people who are still in the country but needed connections, needed help, needed support to stay there, otherwise they were going to leave because they, they were too isolated and too scared. Uh, but also then one for Zimbabwe, 2009-2013, uh, a time of economic crisis and where the university system was under grave threat, and then currently for, for Syria, uh, with Syrian academics in exile, mainly in Turkey. But again, all with the idea of helping them to develop um, in the hope that as and when they, in this case, they can go back, they'll take those extra skills back with them because there's an enormous amount we can learn from them. It's not just helping them to develop their skills, that's important, uh, but also getting what they, they know already and get, making use of that and spreading that around. What we're finding now is that um, people who on our Syria program were initially, they knew a lot, but they hadn't really developed the research skills in the way that you would in a Western university system because in Syria, on the whole, research was done in institutes, not in universities. And PhDs were put into teaching rather than research. But they've come on in the few years they've been with us, and now with a, lot of, with a lot of help from UK universities. There are about 400 individual UK-based academics working with our program, supporting to about 200 Syrian academics. The point where they're now actually recruiting some of those people to work with them on their own university projects, where they want specialists in particular fields which are relevant uh, in, in, from, from the Middle East. So there's a lot of knowledge exchange going on, a lot of learning from each other. And it's really important to keep those connections and to recognize that that's, you know, we have a duty to make sure those skills and that talent isn't lost or, or dissipated, is actually able to, you know, to be used and to help develop. Thanks, Stephen. And Helen, I've, I've, I've hogged your question, so I'm going to bring Vivian in, but let her either add, add to this discussion or give, her a, give you a completely different answer <laughs> to your question. Well, so, I mean, I guess, it Listening to listening to Stephen and and, uh, and, and also uh, to Carol and Sarah talking about it, I guess the first thing I'm going to say is: Are we in an era of climate crisis? Right? Is it not just Syria and then Afghanistan and now Ukraine? But is are we entering a period of history in which a whole bunch of really awful things are going to happen that will affect the way that we work in research? And obviously, we haven't mentioned China in this uh, conversation, but it's now. I think Joe will know, or, or <laughs> Alan will know. And um, now it's either our top collaborative partner and researcher is heading that way. What happens if, if and when they invade Taiwan? You know, we know that that is not an impossibility, and we also know because we've seen how everybody scrabbled around to respond to um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What you would do if you had some sort of egregious act of that nature? So I think that the question, I guess, and it's something that's informed our discussion, Stephen and I, when we talk about Ukraine and other things, that you need to have infrastructure to deal with permacrisis if that's the kind of era that we're in. It can't just be a, an individual response to one crisis. It has to be something like CARA, because CARA's been there in the good times and the bad, whether or not things are on the front pages. Um, so that's one response to the question. The second thing um, I was thinking about recently um, in a discussion uh, I was involved in around sustainability, I started thinking, I wonder what awful, awful problem we're creating through the discoveries that we're making right now. You know, how good are we at anticipating the, the damage that we do through the discoveries that we're, we're making and the, and the technologies that we're implementing? And, and maybe that's just a kind of slightly, I think, I think that's, I don't know whether that's a, terrible, a terribly helpful thought, but are we good enough at, at scrutinizing the impact of the potential future impact of things that we can see are useful. What have we learned from the, the experience we've had in the last 200 years around hydrocarbons? Have we learned anything? Um, the third thing I would suggest is much more kind of, um, I suppose, parochial, and it has to do with disciplinary mix. I mean, thinking about the job that I'm about to take on, I feel a bit like I want to make a, an argument for, um, for knowledge for its own sake and for the disciplines that tend to get squeezed out when people want to talk about um, research in a quite, in a kind of, in, a, in quite an in instrumentalist way. You know, maybe, I don't know, I haven't quite got to the end of that thought process, but maybe as an academic community, we should be much better at arguing for knowledge for its own sake. And then the final thing, which is me throwing a ball at Joanna, is to say, um, if you look at the very kind of near term, I don't think we've noticed, but we've got a problem with the research, the postgraduate research pipeline. And um, Joanna's just been responsible for a piece of research illustrating this. But I guess one of the things we're trying to do with that research is point out the UK may have a problem that it doesn't realise it's got. 
So there you go. There's four things. Thank you. Helen, you've got plenty on your list. I, I think your point, Vivian, around, you know, science is dual purpose as far as I'm concerned. You know, you can use it for good, you can use it for ill. Will you talk about that discovery research, the curiosity driven, I wonder what would happen if you think about quantum mechanics and how it's, you know, quantum tech is now the, the, the top, you know, quantum computing is one of the top strategies of government, but that was not something that was, you know, thought of as physicists. We weren't thinking about quantum computing and science takes a long time. So. We, I think we see some of the risks around emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology. We see them as a force for good. There's also the counter side, and that again comes back to standards, regulatory systems, but also ethics, and then right round that interdisciplinary mix with arts and humanities. And I think that goes back to your first call about, you know, how do we put science in society and what is the point of the, the person writing the book? Actually, that's, that sort of collaboration I think is really important because science sits within society or, you know, to our, to our detriment. I can see Ryan waving me at me at the back. Um, I know we're out of time. Um, Joanna, we're very interested to hear uh, about your study. If you'd like to, to, to give us a couple of minutes, please feel free to. Um, and then after that, I, would, I, will, I will close the session and thank our colleagues and we'll move to Nibbles. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> that was going to happen in the last minute. Um, I think, as Vivian said, it's the kind of problem that nobody really paid attention to and something we've discovered by observing the data for, for a few years now that numbers of international PGR students to the UK are kind of stagnating. They've reached their peak in 2013-14, but never really went back to that peak. There was a slight recovery in the last year, 2020-2021, but, but not to that same peak that where it was before. So we thought, let's have a closer look at that, look at the trends, um, where international postgraduate students coming from, especially also with the uncertain environment at the moment, with the rise in, in fee status for EU students, with the whole um, political situation and the, the relationship of the UK with, with other countries, specifically the EU. And we thought, well, if this is continuing like that, universities might not be able to recruit the number of students that are of post, international postgraduate um, research students that are necessary to, can, to um, support the innovation strategy, the people and culture strategy, the, um, the international education strategy, and contribute meaningfully to the UK science and research base. So that short report um, picks out a few trends, looks at the main sending countries. There's quite an over-reliance on very few countries, and you can imagine which ones. Um, there's a decrease in funding from, or a decrease in provider awards, a decrease in who care I, um, funding over the last four years. Self-funded PGR students are the main source for growth. And um, there's also a decrease in, in EU students um, coming to, to the UK. So if you're interested, uh, have a look at the report and also let us know what you think. We have, I think, six key actions drawing from that and what we should do about it. Quite high level, we're planning uh, to do more, more research. But yes. That's wonderful. Thank you, Joanna. I love the fact that it's solution-based as well. So thank you for that. We'll certainly look out the, uh, the report. So colleagues, I'd like to thank you so much for coming out tonight. I hope this will be the first of many uh, broader discussions. I hope that you will use the opportunity to network if you can stay. Um, I know Sarah has to shoot off, so if anybody wants to have a chat to Sarah before she goes, then prioritize that, please. And I would also like to thank my team and the colleagues at the Royal Society of Chemistry here for hosting us tonight. There's been a huge amount of organization to make this happen. Ryan in particular, pulling it together and making sure that you all got your invitations. You've all been specially invited. So you should be, uh, you should feel pleased to be here. Um, I hope you make new connections tonight and we look forward to building our relationships with you further if you're new and continuing to develop them if, we, if you're old friends. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, our panelists tonight for their wonderful discussions and insights. Thank you very much. Thank you.